This is not a review of a sprite. This is just my weekly video about what I did this week relating to game development. This week I was playing around with a side project slash character for somebody else's side project. Someone is making a roguelike using art assets that are being donated from everyone in the Discord, and I figured I would join in. I started by creating the character you're seeing on screen now, and was talking about how annoying it is to do animation work in GIMP. GIMP is great for a lot of things, but not that. And since I was gifted a copy of a sprite, I figured it was time that I just gave it a shot. But before we get into this video, my name is Helper Wesley, I've made these games, and I make weekly devlogs. So after struggling with the staff character that I made for the roguelike game, I fired up a sprite and was immediately bombarded with a whole bunch of new things that I've never seen before. Now as a general rule, don't look up tutorials, not because I think I'm smart enough to get away without them, but because my brain literally won't let me use them. Which is something that some of you will understand and some of you won't. So let's move on. So I loaded in a mage character that I made previously in GIMP that had a few issues with the cloth dangling from the bottom of it. Because I'm not able to see each frame of the animation side by side like I would in, well hopefully in A-Sprite, you're sort of guessing on whether or not things look appropriate. And I found that with this image, the cloth was kind of flying out too far, if that makes sense. So I touched that up and fixed it. And I'm now realizing just how complicated this is going to be because each frame of an animation gets a bunch of layers and then there's a bunch of frames per animation and like, whew, this is going to be interesting. I started by trying to create a little slime character. They seem to be pretty easy to make, so I started with that. I started by trying to add some detail to the creature, but now, these tools just aren't laid out the same way that they are in GIMP. A lot of them are the same, but I need to like go searching for them in a different way, and some of them I don't think are in GIMP. Like the, the contouring tool and stuff like that. I eventually gave up on that one because I got really frustrated with it, and started over from scratch. I started drawing just a bug character. I don't know what I was trying to draw, but some kind of fly thing. And I didn't know that the mirroring tool existed, and I started ranting about it on the Discord, and someone was like, yeah, no, that exists. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So now that I have the mirroring tool available to me, I decided to try to flesh out the bug and make it properly. I think this might actually be easier for me, since I had been doing all of my animations in GIMP where I'm kind of guessing what each thing looks like next to each other. And so now that I'm actually able to see each frame individually, it's, it's not as hard as I thought it was going to be. I mean, I'm still bad at it, but I can see how somebody who's really good at art would have a really easy time using this program. <laughs> as a disclaimer, I'm not saying my art's good, I'm saying people with good art would have easy time with program. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now that I've got the bug out of the way, I threw that up on Twitter and was like, hey look, bug exists! And then I moved on. Because I didn't draw the bug for anything, I just drew it to practice. So moving on. Somebody in the Discord was talking about drawing a mage character, and so I had mocked up some versions for them, and I've gotten a little more comfortable drawing robes, because they kind of hide the shape of the body which is really nice for anyone who doesn't know what they're doing. So I decided to draw a mage character with the person blacked out, because easier, that was casting some sort of spell. Because if I'm going to do animation, I may as well start with something like that, I guess. I started with 64 by 64 because that's... Well, that was the same size as the last mage I drew. And I think that I'm kind of more comfortable in that range, because the smaller you get, the more each individual pixel matters, and the bigger you get, the more actually knowing what you're doing matters. So 64 feels like there's like a little bit of leeway. You know what I mean? And this animation was going along pretty smoothly, except I kept drawing on the wrong bloody layer. And that's because there were no thumbnails for each layer of the animation. And I thought that's just how it was. But when I ranted about this again on Discord, 
uh, somebody spoke up and said that you can do that. And I was like, oh, like, I guess this is why people go through tutorials and things before they jump into programs and do stuff. Anyhow, armed with this new knowledge that thumbnails are supposed to be a thing that you can see while doing animations, I rocketed right on through this animation and ended up with this. Now I've tweaked a bunch of the settings so it's so it's closer to GIMP's layout, and therefore more familiar to me. And this image wasn't a major improvement, but it was an improvement, and therefore I shared it on Twitter and moved on. I then proceeded to make a whole bunch of junk. Like, a lot of junk. Just junk, junk, junk. That one was almost good, and then junk. This one I was about to call junk, but then I started to play with it and add things to it. And the same way the teenagers draw that Superman S on everything, I just slapped up a bunch of wispy clouds in front of the mountains, and suddenly it turned into this. It's not great, but it's also not bad. And since I don't get a whole lot of free time, I can't exactly sit around admiring my own work. I need to practice. So moving on ahead, I started drawing this thing. And I don't watch Pokemon anymore, I did when I was a kid and I played a lot of the games when I was a kid, but if this thing isn't a Pokemon yet, it will be soon. <laughs> I mean, look at this thing. Don't you just want to squeeze its face? And then I did that and realized, oh, I could just be squashing and stretching my images to make animations. Why haven't I been doing that? Now obviously this is something you can do in just about every tool, it's just it never occurred to me to use it in a sprite. And so I threw out that Pokemon and started working on another robed character. Robes are just really easy to use. You don't even need to have arms and you can tell that this is a person. I set out to make an entire animation solely using the squash and stretch. And it took a while and I did need to tweak a few things here and there because the stretch did some weird things to some weird places. But I ended up with this pretty basic animation of this robed character jumping and then vanishing. And then to reset the animation, I just took some of the frames from the beginning and then reversed them to make them make sense. Now that I've gotten the practice out of the way, it's time for me to take on something a bit bigger. And by a bit bigger, I mean another robed character, but this time they have a sword. Anyhow, following some advice from other animators that I've seen work on YouTube and through art that I've made in the past, I blocked out this character with the arms and legs and body and head being separate layers in the image, so I could move them around and manipulate them as I need to. I started animating out the swing, and what I've learned from other animators is that you want the action to be faster than the refund, or the time spent getting back to your stand-up pose. So if you want an attack to feel punchy, you almost want your first frame to immediately jump into the attack frame, and then you have a slower kind of recoil. And this is kind of what you see in real life too. When you see a boxer punch or you see a, a samurai swing a sword. Are there samurais still in the world today? Anyhow, when you see those people make those actions, they're really quick and then their time spent going back to the position they were standing in is actually slower than the time it took for the punch to swing or the sword to slash. These were things that I've picked up from seeing things move in action, right? Like I went to school for marine engineering, not graphic design or art or any of those things. That would have been really helpful with what I'm doing right now. But I went to school for mechanics and physics. So I get the general concept behind these actions and motions, but I haven't had the practice required to draw them properly. Which is why when I finished this project, after putting the robe on the mage and giving the sword a, a swoosh, or a slash, or a whatever that's called. That thing there, it's on screen now. After doing all of those things and, and making the this slashing mage kind of slash ones then go back into their standing pose, I put it up to the Discord for people to look at and Ben Brooks, our local knows what they're doing person, uh, <laughs> uh, they suggested that I add an easing frame to which I replied, huh? And then they went on to explain that an easing frame is the frame after these actions happen. So when you swing a punch or you slash a sword, 
you typically go further than you meant to go, and then you have this moment of recoil where you swing, and then you pull yourself back to where you meant to actually land the punch, or slash the sword. And these things help sell the strength of a swinger punch. And I was like, cool, well I'm gonna try that right after I wake up in the morning. Because I, I just, I stay up too late doing these things. When I woke up in the morning, I then applied the easing frame, and also applied the squash and stretch to the hood of the samurai mage, I guess, at this point. The head is the only thing that hasn't been moving, based on the position of the character to this point, and so I figured adding that little bit of bounce there would make it more believable. And after doing that, this is the result. I don't know if I'm going to be switching to Ace Braid for everything. I most definitely like GIMP when I'm making larger projects and images, like the ones that I made for Subway Hell. But when it comes to animation, I think I'm going to be using Ace Braid a lot more, and I hope that I can wrap my head around two sets of controls because otherwise it's going to be very complicated getting in and out of one mode and the other. But yeah, this is my first time ever using Ace Braid, and I'm actually pretty impressed. After I got through the general learning curve of it, and after I changed the layout a little bit to suit what I'm used to, it really came together for me. I can really see how people would get into this program and love it. Like I said, I'm still going to be using GIMP for most of my bigger projects, but specifically for animation, I think I'll be using Ace Braid a lot more. Anyhow, if you enjoyed seeing my first time ever using Ace Braid, and would like to see more videos on game dev, art, music, everything, because I do everything myself, then maybe click on that subscribe button. And if you want to talk to me personally, the link to our Discord is down below. It's called the Game Dev Fireside, and it's a pretty chill place to hang out and talk game dev. And if you decide to click on that link, then I'll see you there.